Hillel Fold, welcome to Jewish Money Matters. You are the man dubbed by Forbes as turning startup nation into scale up nation. It is so good to have you on the show. And I know this is going to be a juicy conversation because not only is your work so interesting, but you're one of those people who is super honest, super, you know, and truthfully, when it comes to this topic, I want, this is what I want. I want guests who are not squeamish about talking about money. Who's not, you're not going to beat around the bush. So thank you for being this way. Thank you for being here. And from the get-go, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, bringing Israeli tech and entrepreneurship to the forefront. Wow. What an introduction. I think I should uh, pay you for, for PR. Um, <laughs> so First of all, I, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate being here. And I should say that uh, from my perspective, if I could just get like a fraction of your energy, then, then it was worth it. <laughs> I'm on very little sleep because my kids came home last night from a trip with my husband and I'm on my third cup of matcha chai latte. So there you go. But I, I tend ah. to be pretty enthusiastic, as my listeners know. Let's get started with your career journey, Hillel. What came first, the love of tech or the love of business? Wow, fascinating question. Uh, I don't have a love for business, actually. Uh, in fact, I think that part of whatever success I have achieved is because I don't have a love of business. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, what I mean is, first of all, I always loved tech. Uh, I'm talking way before it was cool to love tech. Everyone loves tech today. And, you know, today, geek is the new cool. I was just a geek, right? I turned on a computer and it blew my mind. Um, and so I knew, I knew that I was going to be doing something in the world of technology. I had no idea what, nor did I have any idea how I was going to get there because I'm not an engineer. Um, and so long story short, I ended up, um, my first job was a technical writer, which I don't know if you know what that is. I did not know what it was. And it's a, uh, it's the guy who writes the user guide to get with your iPhone that no one ever reads. Oh gosh. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So as you can imagine, that was not exactly a compatible uh, job or career choice for me, but um, I did learn the couple of years that I worked in that position, I did learn that I, I really have this deep, deep love for technology because here I am documenting enterprise servers and I was still excited. So I was like, wow, there's something very wrong with me. But um, I just, you know, I just started blogging and entrepreneurs would reach out and meet them. And the reason I say I don't have a love for business is because if I had a love for business, at least in the traditional sense, 95% of what I do in my career, I would never have done. Mm -hmm. Namely, meeting with entrepreneurs and offering them help and offering them introductions to investors, introductions to journalists, all for free. Um, I just got off the phone literally five minutes ago with a, uh, a U.S. mayor, uh, who shall remain unnamed, but a very big supporter of Israel. And he's starting a new initiative to help bring Israeli companies to the U.S. And he basically said to me, listen, you know, I'd love introductions and I'm glad to compensate you for the introductions. And I said, well, I'll gladly provide introductions, but I'm not taking any compensation because I don't, that's not my model. I don't believe in monetizing my relationships. And so again, in the traditional sense of the word, you know, well, you look at the real estate world or many other industries, people take referral fees. And so mm -hmm. for me, it's just a love of tech period. I, I love what you just communicated here because so many of us get caught up in the Basically, let me say it like this. You just in, in, imply that you build, you designed this dream job of yours. And I've heard you say many times how blessed you are to get to do this every day. I feel the same way about my work. This was not something that was, you know, you applied for. Some hiring manager wrote this job description. You literally took decisive, brave, unconventional action one step at a time, and you built this career path for yourself. So I want you well, to dive a little deeper, Kilo, because so many people get stuck in this. They get stuck in these two lies. Number one, who am I to do this? And number two, I could never make money doing that. And here you are proof that that is not the truth. Wow. Okay. So I have so much to say on that. <laughs> Let's do um, it. First of all, I, I, I would like to take credit and say, you know, I, I, I planned all this. It was all a strategy of mine. But in reality, when I started my career, the words tech blogger or podcaster or startup advisor were not even in the dictionary. That was not a thing. And I did not plan for it. I just love tech. And in reality, my first tech job, I was head of marketing at a tech company. And within about, I'd say three to four months, the CEO actually changed my title on my business card to senior evangelist. Literally, he said to me, you're evangelizing the company. You're evangelizing Israeli tech. Go do your thing and, you know, help elevate our brand, but not by traditional marketing with SEO and PPC, just do your thing. And so that's really how my career started as a quote unquote evangelist. Um, but, you know, again, I, I didn't plan for this. And at the end of the day, I know this is somewhat cliche, but it really comes down to passion, right? My passion for technology is 
a little bit nuts. Like I, I just love anything to do with tech. And so, you know, I just went all in on my passion. That's the truth. And, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak um, commencement speech, uh, U.S. college, which, by the way, you, you, you alluded to this before about uh, imposter syndrome, kind of saying like, who am I to do this? But in reality, I feel imposter syndrome every, day, every single day of my life. And so when I got this email from a U.S. college saying, hey, we want you to come do a commencement speech, I was like, who do you think I am, Bill Gates? Like what, me, a commencement speech? And then I thought to myself and I said, you know what? That's exactly the point I'm gonna focus on. And I got up there and I said, listen guys, you guys are getting your MBA. I am such, I'm just a, a random person who started writing about tech because he loved tech. I went all in on my passion. I ignored all the business advice that I got in the early years to monetize everything. And that's how I ended up here on this stage talking to you. And I said to them, whatever your dream is, even if it's completely impossible, unattainable, You'll attain it if you go all in on your passion. And the most impossible things have happened to me over the years. I mean, like literally impossible. Like what are the chances? I'm sorry. Like what are the chances that a guy sitting in Beit Shemesh, Israel is going to find himself in the lobby of a hotel with the man who invented the computer and founded apple.com? Like it's completely impossible, but it happened. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, you mentioned the MBA. I, I have an MBA and one of my biggest pet peeves is all the stuff they don't teach you at MBA programs. Right. And you just alluded, you didn't use these words, but you alluded at the way you operate in your business with tremendous empathy, with tremendous desire for connection, with intimacy. And that is at the core of building a business is how can I be of service with my passion, with my talents, with everything I got here? This is what I got to offer. How can I serve you? I, 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 you could not have said it better. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to do something right now that I don't, I wouldn't do often in an interview. I'm going to read something to you because there's a book uh, that I'm sure, you know, Tim Ferriss. So mm -hmm. one of his chapters, and I think it was uh, tools of Titans is a chapter called the canvas strategy. And it's a, it's a strategy invented by Ryan holiday. And I read this and it was like music to my ears because what he did was basically give a name to everything that I had been practicing. And so I, the concept is very simple. When you provide value, when you help others win or you pave the road for others to go on their way to success, you end up going down that road as well. And so I'm just going to read you, if I may, a couple of sentences, because it's, it's really like poetry. It's really unbelievable. He said, there is an old saying, say little, do much. What we really ought to do is update and apply a version of that to our approach. Be lesser and do more. Listen to this sentence. Imagine that for every person you met, you thought of some way to help them, something you could do for them. And you looked at it in a way that would entirely benefit them and not you. The cumulative effect this would have on society would be profound. You'd learn a great deal by solving diverse problems. You develop a reputation for being indispensable, right? You'd have countless favors to call on down the road. And you would build all these relationships by focusing on value, right? That's what the Canvas strategy is about. I'm almost done. Helping yourself by helping others. Making a concerted effort. This is just music to my ears. To trade your short-term gratification for a long-term payoff. And here it is. This is the final, this is the punchline. And it's, I'm telling you, it's, this is like, it's everything, okay? He says like this, where everyone else wants to get credit and be respected, you can forget credit. You can forget it so hard that you're glad when others get it instead of you because that was your aim after all. And here it is. Let others take credit on credit while you defer and earn interest on the principal. Amazing. Yes. yes. Amazing. Focus yes. on value. <laughs> the, the profit, it will come. It will come back. I promise you. By the way, to be very clear, I'm not talking about karma. People say to me all the time, oh, it's good karma. Forget karma. No. You don't pay for groceries with karma. It's good business. When you help others win, when you create a canvas for other people to create masterpieces on, you end up winning. Period. Full stop. A hundred percent. Can we just go preach this at every single MBA program across the world, please, people? Yes, music to my ears, 100%, couldn't agree more. Now, paying groceries, I could just hear the resistance, right, from people, you know, uh, interviewing people, uh, writing, I really can never make money, could never make money at that. That's for Oprah. Okay, that was Hill of Fall. That's Yael Trush. When does the money start coming in, Hill, and how? So, I mean, it's a great question, and the answer is... I when you focus on providing enough value for others, it ends up coming back. I mean, I'll read you again. I, I've never in my life read anything on in an interview, but this is now the second time I'm reading something to you, but it's important. I got an email many years ago, completely unsolicited. I had never asked this, this person to email me. I never asked anything from this person. It was a company. It is a company in Silicon Valley that built an amazing product that I just loved. I just loved the product and I did my thing. I just helped them. I never, this is a multi-billion dollar company. I didn't have the chutzpah to ask them for anything. Who the hell am I? 
-hmm. I get this email out of the blue, completely unsolicited. I'm reading the email to you word for word. The subject is from the CEO of this company. The subject is thank you. Hillel, I won't ever forget your enduring support for what we have been building over the years. It's time we got you some stock and asked you to be a formal advisor. I know you wouldn't ask for this, but it's the right thing to do. I hope you'll accept. We are only just beginning, and I could really use your advice when you have the time. All the best. I mean, there you go. wild. That says it all. Wild. So the answer to your question is every single company that I'm working with, without any exceptions, zero exceptions, are companies that I helped and I demonstrated what I can do for them. And then they came back to me and said, listen, we know what you did for us. We know your abilities because you demonstrated them. What are your terms? How do we work with you? So that's it. That's the answer. Serve. Let's just serve first. Lead with a service. I love it. So do you also invest in some of these companies, Hillel? And if so, when you're looking at startups from an investor perspective, um, again, something that you have no formal training on, what are you looking for? So first of all, I, I, when you say invest, I'm assuming you mean capital, actual money. Mm-hmm. I don't invest capital. I invest, mm-hmm. you know, sweat capital, as they say, in terms of you know my effort, my connections, okay. everything I can do. But I don't invest actual capital. But I do work as an advisor to four different uh, venture funds, mm-hmm. and every one of them is in a different stage. There's no conflict of interest between them, but I work with them on getting deal flow, you know, startups. I work with them on, on due diligence when relevant. I work with them on marketing. Um, and so I, I do wear the hat, quote unquote, of an investor, even though I don't invest my own money. And okay. so, uh, you know, there is so, there's so much literature on how to find winning entrepreneurs. Um, I'm not sure that I have what to add, but I will say at the end of the day, and again, pardon me for the cliche, at the end of the day, what, what separates and what differentiates the winners from the losers are the people, the entrepreneurs, their passion. In fact, I spoke to one of the first investors in Uber, and he said to me that when Travis, the ex-CEO of Uber, came into his office and pitched Uber to him, he had been to 90 other VCs, and they all said no. And he said, this guy, has to, for him to succeed, laws have to be changed. Regulations have to be changed. So much has to happen for Uber to win. But he said to me, I saw the fire in his eyes. And it was clear to me that if anyone can do it, he could. And so the answer is, yes, of course, you have to have differentiating factors. You have to have technology. You have to have, you know, defensibility so others don't steal your technology. But the end of the day, to me, it comes down to the people. If you have an entrepreneur that is on a mission, that's when you know this this company has high chances of success. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's turn it. um, Let's segue a little bit into your um upbringing, your mindset. And, you know, as you know, so much about our mindset and behaviors around money really come from childhood, right? Those formative years, what we saw and heard um, from our parents, from our home of origin, what was your upbringing like when it came to money? Any lessons that stand out, whether positive or negative that you learned? When it comes to money specifically, I mean, listen, I grew up in a, an observant home. Uh, my dad is a rabbi, an educator. My mom's also an educator. And so I grew up in, in very much in like an you know, education oriented home. Um, you know, I, listen, my, my parents aren't doctors and lawyers who, you know, were chasing, not that all doctors and lawyers chase money, but I'm saying it wasn't, it wasn't a top priority in our home. You know, I had everything that I needed. And I, you know, I often ask my children, ask my children now, do you, do you appreciate that you have everything that you need? And so, you know, my, my only, I would say the only thing that I got in terms of money from my parents is that it's important, but within, you know, perspective, let's put it in perspective. And so, Really, you know, I've, I, I mean, I, my whole career is built on this. I have zero aspirations to be, you know, the next Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. I have zero aspirations to see billions in my bank account. I really don't. My aspirations are to provide for my family, live, you know, stable, you know, in terms of income and give my, give my kids a good future. I, that's really all I want. And that's, to me, that's what I got from my parents, that money is important in order to achieve things. It's not important as an end. It's just a means to an end. And that's right. It's a mean to an end, but it's such a powerful means that God has given us, right? We could do so much with it. Um, yeah. So any financial habits that you say, you would say you practice, quote unquote, religiously, like habitual? Yeah. So first of all, I, I want to just add that I literally this morning, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences. There's a reason I saw this video this morning. This morning, I'm not kidding. I saw a video on TikTok um, <laughs> about, about, by the way, I don't know what your thoughts are on TikTok, but I could talk about TikTok for hours. It's a phenomenal oh, wow. platform, but not, not for now. Um, no, because people think of TikTok, they think of like girls dancing. But in reality, every single brand, you know, it's, it's like the early days of Twitter. People said, oh, it's a stupid platform. Now look at it, right? Mm-hmm. So d- don't, don't, uh, don't write off TikTok so fast. But anyway, this woman was saying that, you know, people say money is not the most important thing. And she's like, okay, it's not. But money does affect every single thing that's the most important thing. Your lifestyle, your family, your health. Money affects it all. Your marriage, right. So it might not be the most important thing in the world, but it affects and impacts all the things that are the most important things in the world. Everything. Absolutely everything. Yeah. So 
going back to the habits, what, what's, what are, what are your, what are you, what, what's your stuff? What do you do regularly that keeps you on track? It's a really good question. So uh, disclaimer, full disclaimer, I have to be, you know, I'm not very good at budgeting. Uh, I, I should say, I'm like, you know, I guess I'm grateful that I never really had to budget. I, I, uh-huh. I, I don't think I've ever said these words out loud, but I have literally never in my life looked at the price of anything in a supermarket ever. Like I just, I'm like, my mentality is like, what am I working my butt off if I can't spend the money kind of thing? Of course, you know, lately I've been thinking as a more of a, as a responsible adult of the future and putting money aside, et cetera. Um, but uh, in reality, it's for me, you ask me what I do in terms of money. I just work my butt off. I work, I work my butt off. I try to give as much as I can. And at the end of the day, like I said, it, it translates into money. Uh, something that, you know, I will say that I've kind of recently thought about is that over the years, many, many hundreds probably of entrepreneurs have said to me, you know, I'd love to work with you, but I can't afford you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this retainer that you take is way too high for, for an early stage startup. And so about, you know, six months ago, I said to myself, well, how do I not leave money on the table, right? All these entrepreneurs want to work with me and they can't afford me. I'm leaving money on the table. So I said to myself, well, instead of working one to one, one on one with an entrepreneur, why don't I work one to many? Yeah. And so literally a couple of months ago, I launched my own entrepreneurship course. And I said, you know, it's it's a course from, you know, I have an idea now what to how to find the right investors, how to make an investor's deck, how to go to market, the whole thing, like the whole spectrum. And I instead of taking my, my regular retainer, which is much significantly higher, I took $2,000 per entrepreneur. And I capped the course at 15 entrepreneurs. So I wanted it to be intimate. And so, you know, pretty much sold that right away. And so here I am giving a course that's, you know, thank God it's generating as much revenue, as much money as me working with, you know, entrepreneurs for six months. And this is a course of four hours. Mm-hmm. So that was a nice uh, kind of gold mine. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, for me, when I think of money, I, again, to me, that's a means to an end. And the only thing that I would do and can continue to do and will hopefully do for as long as I'm given the opportunity to do is work hard and do what I love. Uh, you know, I, I also love group coaching. I think the energy, you know, the energy in a group program is fantastic. Talking, going back to making the money, you said that now you're taking more, let's say, quote unquote, responsible, the boring stuff, making the money work for you. What, 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 what's your, what's your strategy? You're going to, you know, are you investing in individual tech stocks since you love tech? Are you more of like, let's just put it in the overall stock market. I like real estate. What, what, what's that looking like for you? So I, I wish I had a better answer that I, I mean, the answer is um, I, I do not pay the markets. I mean, I, I invested in one stock just because of one of my best friends. And it's kind of like said that you're investing in the stock and that's it. So I invested, but I don't play the markets. Um, again, it's not very exciting, not very sexy, but I'll say it anyway. There is an organization, a nonprofit organization in Israel mm-hmm. that it, what they do is they help people budget. Now, you know, again, thank God, you know, my business is good and steady and, you know, I don't, I don't need this right now. I don't need to learn how to budget right now, but somewhere down the line, I will. And so why not learn now? And so I'm, I'm working with this organization. Pamonim is the name of the organization. Uh, and they literally they come to your house, they go over your spending habits, they go over your income and they optimize the way you spend money. And so yeah. I'm learning, I'm learning now. Uh, the first thing that we're doing is kind of writing down everything we spend money on, which is definitely not a habit that comes easy to me. Um, but, uh, you know, like I'm learning this, it's, it's, it's really a new muscle. It's like, it's like going to the gym and starting to w- lift weights when you've never done it before. Like it's a, it's just training yourself to do something that's super important, but it's a completely new skill set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm more of a like budget or non-budgeter really. I just kind of like take care of the boring, responsible stuff first, you know, make sure that that saving and that investment is happening and then like you like I pretty much kind of have my benchmarks and I'm very in touch with my cash flow and so is my husband and so we have regular meetings. We know what's coming in, wow. what needs to leave and we just, you know, kind of plan like that. But like I feel that, I don't know, that works for me rather than sticking to, oh, I have to spend $500 in supermarket. <laughs> I can't do right. that. No, I, I, it sounds like you guys are on top of it. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. You have meetings and everything. That's amazing. I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Maybe I'll be you when I grow up. We, we call it money dates. You, you and your wife could adopt them. They're really helpful. <laughs> Very interesting. I, I want to hear more about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk your language. Let's talk tech. Um, I'm not such a tech person, but when it comes to fintech, that was really exciting to me. And, you know, we've made such strides in financial technology since the last recession. It's like mind blowing. Are you seeing anything in the fintech space, financial technology that's exciting to you? I know that's not particularly necessarily your field, but is there anything that's come up that, you know, stands out? Yeah, 100 percent. By the way, the first sentence that you just said is you're not much of a tech person. I beg to differ. I think that in today's day and age, if you compare a person who's, quote unquote, not a tech person, to a non-tech person 30 years ago, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, you are a completely, you are a completely tech person. Like look at how much tech you use on a regular basis. I mean, look up just to, to even record this interview, the amount of tech that you're using. So we're all tech people today. We all have smartphones. We all download apps. We're all tech people. Um, but uh, yeah, FinTech is super duper hot, obviously, especially in Israel. Um, one of the, one of the VCs that I work with group 11, a guy named Dovi Francis, who's actually one of the sharks on the Israeli version of Shark Tank. Um, mm-hmm. he, he, fo- he invests uh, exclusively in FinTech. And uh, I've seen some incredible companies, both through his portfolio, but also companies that I've worked with over the years. I mean, one that just pops into my head right now is a company called Tip Ranks, T-I-P-R-A-N-K-S. Mm-hmm. And they're a massive, massive financial data platform. I mean, you might have heard of Seeking Alpha or many other platforms where they give, you know, whether it's trading advice or the ability to follow a successful trade or other things. These guys are huge. I mean, you, any any you know financial platform that you know of is using their data. They're massive, um, and it's it's funny because so many people use their technology, and so few people know that they're Israeli. Uh, that's true about many companies in Israel. But um, yeah, that's that's a phenomenal company. There's another company that I, I met recently, uh, V E E V is the name of the company, um, and they help. Um, I guess how to explain this in an easy way. They help uh, employees capitalize on their non-spent sick days or vacation days, right? Because you have vacation days, comes to the end of the year and you have all this quote unquote money left over. What do you do with it? Yeah. And so they built a whole platform to deal with that. And I mean, listen, I've met some unbelievable fintech companies in this over the years. Not even, listen, one, another company that pops into my head right now is um, a company called Intelligo Group. And what they do is they've built uh, AI, artificial intelligence powered background checks, because if you look at the way background checks are done in 2021, it's ridiculous. I went with him with the CEO to Washington to meet with really top level, um, you know, uh, political, I don't even know what you want to call it in Washington, basically. And we met with them. They were talking about uh, the entrance, in, the entry into the United States and customs. And they were saying that they have a backlog of about 300,000 people who they're still running background checks on because running a background check is ridiculous. It basically yeah. takes you like a month. And then what you give the customer is like this big 500 page document. And if this person has a felony, it's on page 475. No one's ever going to know it. And if once you give them that background check, the next day they go and they kill someone, you don't know because you did the background check yesterday. So these guys are doing ongoing background checks and it's a matter, it's a web, you know, web platform. And why, why is this fintech? Because like I said to you before, investors are looking for people, right? Good people to invest in. But how do you know if a person's a good person? So using their technology, you can run background checks on tech executives who are looking to raise money and say, okay, do I want to invest in this person? Or is there some shady background that I should know about? So, so cool. So, so cool. Hello. Um, your brother's life, your brother, Ari of blessed memory, his life was taken um, tragically by a 16 year old Arab terrorist um, a pain that I feel like the whole entire Jewish nation felt with you. When I think about you and Ari and your work, um, in a sense, you both kind of do the same thing in, 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 in your own way. And I, I probably have to give a lot of credit. We should give a lot of credit to your parents for this. But what I mean by that is that your work goes beyond you know, helping entrepreneurs and business leaders in, in the tech space. At its core, it has a very strong element of advocacy, of being a lamplighter, of being a voice for Israel, a voice of positivity. My question is, do you think that Ari's passing and the inability of him continuing that legacy and that voice here in this physical world, did this infuse your, your work with a greater sense of mission? Did it amplify your voice? Very interesting question. For starters, if I may, I'm going to correct you a little bit because uh, a lot of people use the word, you know, he passed away or Ari's passing. Let's say it as it is, Ari's murder. It's important to say what it was. Thank you. Know? you. Yes. That's first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you, but no, I didn't um, want to be crude, but yes. <laughs> I didn't want right. to like. So, you know, he didn't, he didn't pass away of a heart attack. He was murdered exactly. by a 60 year old terrorist. Um, okay. So the answer is, first of all, you nailed it, right? I, I I say this all the time. No one's ever said it to me, but you're, you're spot on in that both of us, uh, advocated for Israel. He did it through, you know, regular Israel advocacy, quote unquote, and I do it through technology. But at the end of the day, like you said, at the foundation, we're both promoting Israel. Uh, and that's that's a fascinating observation on your part. Uh, we both, by the way, not only do we both advocate for Israel, but we both use social media to do it. So there are a lot of similarities and overlap between our work. Um, you know, I think, listen, what, what he contributed to this world is, I, I don't have another word to think of besides... Uh, 
it's outrageous. It's outrageous. And it's, it's even maybe even supernatural that a person, you know, who lived 46 years on this planet was able to touch millions of lives, literally millions of lives. And so, yeah, it's definitely an inspiration, both for me and for everyone that knew Ari, there's no question about that. Um, but uh, I mean, listen, you know, I just keep going and doing what you're doing. Um, maybe I kind of threw a little more uh, gas on the fire after he was murdered. But, um, you know, I think we, we both shared that mission. And by the way, you're also spot on when you say we have to thank my parents for that, because 100 percent, you know, the love of Israel and the, um, the, the, the burning need to, to defend Israel from all the poisonous lies out there is something that we definitely grew up with in, in our home um, as we had very Zionistic parents. And again, the word Zionism even today is like a dirty word, but in reality, it's 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 the exact opposite. And so, yeah, 100 percent. My parents to thank for that. And um, yeah, Ari, uh, Ari did some unbelievable things in this, on this on this planet. We didn't touch on this, but you came to Israel as a teenager, didn't you? Your parents made Aliyah when you were a teen. That is correct. I was 15 years old and I can understand why I'm all messed up. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it was a tough age. There's no question about it. Uh, ninth grade, I was in uh, I was in school in New York and 10th grade, I was in school in Jerusalem. So mm. you can imagine it was quite the quite the culture shock. Um, fast forward 28 years and it's the best thing that ever happened to me, both personally and professionally. But at the time, uh, there was definitely some uh, definitely some opposition on my end and definitely some some thoughts of going back when I you know grow up, etc. But uh, happy best thing that ever happened to me no question about it Baruch Hashem. Hillel, you're an observant jew um how do you think your faith your jewish observance impacts your work how does it inform it how do you navigate um this in the space that you move around so that's a question i get very often because not only am i an observant jew but i i'm very vocal about my religion right i, I sign off every friday for, for shabbat and i announce to the world that i'm signing off and i am strictly kosher and so the answer is, it might surprise you, but it's not only, not only is it not an obstacle, but it's actually becomes kind of part of my brand. And I'll just tell you one really nice story. In fact, I'll tell you three really nice stories. They're quick. Um, I was in Silicon Valley a few years ago, meeting with a senior uh, executive at Google. Uh, I think his title is, I'm not sure. It's, he, re he reports straight to the CEO. Uh, his name is Bradley Horowitz. By the way, he's not Jewish, just totally random. <laughs> his name Jewish. is Bradley Horowitz. He's not <laughs> Jewish. Uh, anyway, I went to meet with him and, uh, I, you know, I walk into his office. It was a social meeting, not a business meeting, just catching up. And, uh, I come into his office and he has a massive tray of sushi on the table. And I'm like, what is this? And he goes, I ordered you kosher sushi. I was like, holy cow. Now you have to understand in Silicon Valley, there's no kosher like food. There's no kosher restaurants. So this guy, again, senior executive at Google knew me so well from my content that he knew to go order me kosher sushi from outside of Silicon Valley. To me, that was like the epitome of, look how people respect you when you stand up for what you believe in. And so that's one story. The second story is uh, a couple of years ago, I get, a, uh, I get a message on Instagram, a comment on Instagram from some lady who I did not know. I don't know her name even. I couldn't even tell you her name. And she said, you know, I'm an, I'm an unaffiliated Jew. I haven't lit Shabbos candles in 40 years. But your Shabbos posts made me start lighting again. I was like, I didn't even know what to do with that. It was unbelievable. And then a third story was a woman who I am in touch with in California. I didn't even know she was Jewish. Literally didn't even know she was Jewish. And I have, I saved the, uh, I saved the, 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 the message she sent me because it's just so beautiful. I'm not going to read it now. But she said something along the lines of, you know, your faith posts have been so inspirational for me. My family kept our first Shabbos, this Shabbos, and I cried like a baby. I was wow. like, holy cow, it's unbelievable. So the answer is my religion and my, you know, the vocal nature of how I, I publicize Judaism. And I, you know, I talk Torah every Friday and I connect it to business and things like that. Uh, again, not only is it not an obstacle, but it's actually become somewhat of, you know, part of my brand. And, and, and the reason that is, is because I don't shy away from it. And I think that's an important lesson. Own up to your identity, whatever you are, whoever you are, own it. Don't be ashamed. And I think that people really respect that. Yeah, yeah. And not only do we, you know, we act as lamplighters, but like you, like with the first story you told me, you know, non-Jews respect Jews who respect themselves. That's, yeah. that is, that is a fact. And that is the bottom line. Hello, let's wrap it up with what I call Jewish money matters fill in the blanks. And this is a part of the show where I'll give you an open-ended sentence and you'll finish it with whatever first thing comes to mind. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. When I give my sir or tzedakah, I like to give to special needs. Oh, beautiful. Why, why that particular cause? Uh, I worked in Hask, uh, you know, Hebrew Academy for special, uh, special children, two summers, best summers of my life. And, um, you know, 
I don't want to get too philosophical here, but the Talmud teaches that we we lost the ability to you know to have prophets, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it says in the in the Talmud, it says that the prophecy was given to the quote unquote, and this is a horrible word, but it, I'm just I'm directly uh, you know translating. Prophecy was given to the fools, quote yeah. unquote fools. Now, of course, God forbid, I'm not calling anyone a fool, but I do believe honestly, and I know this is this is going to sound crazy to you and maybe your listeners, but I really do believe that special needs individuals have a sixth sense. I really, really believe that. 100%. And it was, it was the most satisfying, you know, summers of my life. I learned more than I've learned throughout my entire life. And it's just something that is very, very close to my heart. And, um, you know, I, I just, I just, I don't know what else to say. I love them. They're affectionate. They're it just, I learned so much from special needs. Yeah. I could totally relate to this. I'm, I'm, I'm very much involved with friendship circle. I, I also have it. It's, it's a sweet spot um, in my yes. life. Definitely. Um, I'd love to make more money because. Love to make money because uh, I want my family to be happy. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. That's happiness. Is, that's, <laughs> it doesn't depend on money. Hold on. Let me, let me give me a second to think about this. I want to make more money because I want to focus on what's really important in the world. Hmm. And money gives me the freedom to do so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always say that financial statements are value statements, right? What we really need to be focusing is in what are those core values that I want to be financing? And when we do that, it's like literally living in alignment, right? It's like all the financial stress goes down because we really are using this resource for what's really important. And it's very hard to do. Very, very hard to do. We live in a, in a time where, you know, really getting to the core of what's really really valuable is not super easy. Although COVID kind of like put it at the forefront. All right. Something I wish I'd learned about money growing up is. Um, something I wish I learned about money growing up is. Um, that it is directly correlated with doing good. Beautiful money, spiritual or physical. Ooh, wow. Money, spiritual or physical. I think that depends on the person. I think it could be both. Hmm. Totally depends on, you know, it's, it's subjective. It could be spiritual. It could be physical, depending how you perceive it. Something I splurge on unapologetically is? Food. Really? You're a foodie? Oh, my God. It's not a joke. I, I, I eat out. Well, you live in Israel. Often. It's very easy to be a foodie. Yes. You know, it's really interesting. People that live in Israel think American food is better. People live in America think Israeli food is better. It's really interesting. But um, really? no, I listen, you know, know what? Uh, yeah. I mean, like I just, you know, I just, just, just now I was running an errand and my wife mentioned to me like a couple hours ago, she made me lunch. I was on Zooms all day. So she made me lunch. And then she said to me, like in passing, you know, I didn't even have a second to eat. So I was out. There's a sushi store. So I got her sushi. Like, you know, I don't even, I don't think twice about it. I'm like, you know, food, it's, we gotta, we gotta eat to live. And so I spend a, an embarrassing amount of money on a, on a monthly basis on food. <laughs> Hello, fold spender or saver. <laughs> I think I know the answer to that. No, sa- saver and me don't even go in the same sentence. <laughs> Today I am most grateful for. Today I am most grateful for uh, my family. Yes. And finally, I'm Hillel Fold, and I believe Jewish money matters because. Because we are light onto the nations. Beautiful. Hillel Fold, thank you for everything that you're doing. This was such a treat, such a pleasure. I can't wait to release it to the world. Tell everybody where we can find you. Um, so first of all, uh, I guess my, my online kind of screen name is Hills full. My mom always called me Hills instead of Hill. So it's H I L Z like zebra F U L D my last name. So that's what I am on Twitter and Instagram and, uh, you know, all the other platforms, but really the best way to just kind of connect is on hillfold.com. I have a nice kind of form on the bottom of the website. If you want to reach out and, uh, anybody that's ever emailed me knows that they get a response in about four seconds. Um, so feel free to reach out and, uh, yeah, glad to connect with any of your listeners. Keep spreading that light and let's meet in person next time I'm in Israel. Please God soon. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Done. So, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, that was great. That was awesome. Really. Thank you. Really, really awesome. So I'll let you know when it airs. Um, I have just one idea that I, if you have time at some point, something comes in your mind, send it my way. I really want to run a series at some point of financial Aliyah success stories. You know, I kind of want to demystify, kind of break this stigma of like, oh, you got to go to Israel with one mil, two billion to become a millionaire, you know, like people who really go there, real humans and really make it. 
And I've gotten a lot of like, no, no, no. And then somebody told me, you know, who's actually going to be able to give you a good perspective? Hello fold. Yeah. So- I, I, I don't, I don't buy, I don't, I don't know if this is part of the whatever, but I, I don't buy the whole, you have to lower your quality of life when you come to Israel. I just, it's simply not true. Uh, right, I, so I say- want to tackle that. So I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do that. I'll just say that if you're good at what you do and you're willing to work hard, not only can you make as much money in Israel as you do in the States, you can actually make more because think about all the innovation and tech that's going on here, right? So, mm. you know, yes, if you're, if you're, you know, not good at what you do, you're not a hard worker, then you'll end up, you know, not making good money. But I can tell you that myself, my friends, people that I work with literally are making more money than our investment banker and lawyer and doctor friends in the States. So it's just, it's really is an urban legend, at least now. It used to be true, by the way. It used to, yes, you know, today, I think the only thing that um, kind of is still a gap between Israel and the U.S. cars. Cars are ridiculous here. Mm. But other than that, like, I mean, obviously tuition, you know, there's no question. And healthcare, no question. Real estate is questionable, you know, depends what city. But in reality, quality of life here is equal, if not actually, to me, it's better. I mean, when I'm when I'm in the States visiting my friends, I get, I'm get i excited by all the, you know, the gosh meals in the first two days. And then I want to throw up. I'm like, get me mm-hmm. back to Israel. You know? So uh, to yeah. me, quality of life here is better. You, you sound like my husband. So if any, any, if you know of any people that would be great candidates for an interview on that topic, um, that would be awesome. Michael Eisenberg, not even a question. Okay. Do you want to hook us up at some point? So sh- shoot me an email, send just a separate email saying, hi, hello. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I know you mentioned Michael as someone who would promote Aliyah in term, from a financial perspective. I'd love to host him on my podcast. I'll just forward it to him and ask him. He's a very busy guy, very big investor. So he might, he might say no, but I, I would imagine he would say yes, given that it's an important cause. Yeah, it is important. All right, Hill, I'll let you go to a next meeting. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Bye.